Hi all, this is Vaisharyam Kumar. So today we will be discussing regarding your ankle complex. So ankle complex, as you know, is one of the most complex joint inside the or inter human body. So the most complex joint within the human body is your knee, knee complex. Next comes your ankle complex because of the numerous ligamentous attachment as well as, well as your different joints are present inside this complex. So and your muscle attachment, all this forms the ankle complex, which makes it more complex joint in the human body. So coming to the introduction, so ankle complex, so it is analogous to your wrist and hand complex, and it has a number of distinct differences to optimize its role to bear weight. So comparing to your wrist and hand complex, so it also have the same function of the wrist and hand complex, but the main function is to bear the body weight stretches they are the stretches that permit both stability and mobility depending on the condition acting of so whether the person is landing on a flat surface or the person is landing on the irregular surface the stretcher the, they will be functioning in a particular manner the foot is able to sustain large weight bearing stresses while accommodating to a variety of surfaces and activities the foot must be stable to provide an adequate base of support and function as a rigid lever for pushing off when walking, running or jumping. The foot is the main part which is responsible for working as a rigid lever during the push off phase of the gait cycle during walking, running or jumping. So mainly for the push off function will be mainly through your foot. And the ankle or foot complex meets these diverse requirements through the integrated movements of its 28 bonds that forms 25 component joints. So the ankle and foot complex consists of 28 bonds and these 28 bonds will be forming the 25 separate joints. So what are the joints including in the ankle and foot complex? They are the proximal and distal tibiofibular joints, talocrural or ankle joints, Talocalcaneal or subtalar joints, talonavicular and calcaneic cuboid joints together forms the transverse tarsal joints and tarsometatarsal joints, which are five in numbers, metatarsophalangeal joints, which are five in numbers, interphalangeal joints, which are nine in numbers. And the bonds of the foot are traditionally divided into three functional segments. So mainly the foot are classified into three different parts. So they are the hind foot, mid foot and forefoot. So the hind foot, the bones includes talus and calcaneus and the bones which is included in the mid foot are navicular, cuboid and three cuneiform bones and the bones which are included in the forefoot are metatarsals and the phalanges. So in this diagram you can able to see the analogous analog, analogy between your wrist and hand complex and your ankle and foot complex. So both will be structurally similar and functionally also similar but the ankle and foot complex has additional one function that is to bear the weight of your body towards your ground and it should be transmitted to, towards the ground through the help of this ankle and foot complex. So 50 percentage will be carrying and through the subtalar joint and it will be carried to the calcaneal region or heel region by 25 percentage and remaining 25 percentage will be carried throughout the forefoot. So this is how the weight bearing is happening inside the foot. And coming to the structural organization and bonds of, and joints of ankle and foot, the bonds of the ankle joints includes the tibia, fibula and talus and the bones of the foot includes in rear foot we have calcaneus and talus, mid foot we have navicular cuboid and cuneiforms and forefoot we have metatarsals and phalanges and coming to the joints of the ankle complex mainly includes terracrural joints as the next joint is your proximal tibiofibular joint and distal tibiofibular joints. Talocrural joint is otherwise known as ankle joint and the joints of the rear foot is subtalar joints that is a joint below the talus bone and that is formed by the talus and calcaneum and next joint 
the joints of the midfoots include transverse tarsal joints, so which have two joints, that is the talonavicular and calcaneocuboid, and distal intertarsal joints, mainly include your cunonavicular, cuboidonavicular, intercuniform, and cuneocuboid complex. The joints of the forefoot include tarsal metatarsal joints, intermetatarsal joints, metatarsal phalangeal joints, intraphalangeal joints. So these are the joints and bones of the ankle and foot complex. And so this is the graphical representation of the divisions or segments of the foot. So these are the functional segments. So in these functional segments, all the parts of the bones are included. So in the hind foot, you can see the calcaneus and talus. And in the mid foot, you can see the navicular cuboid cuneiforms. In the forefoot, we can see the metatarsals and the phalanges. And this is the graphical representation of three parts. So differentiated by the different colors. So three colors for three different segments. So pink color for your rear foot and brown, uh, sorry, blue color for your mid foot and light blue for your forefoot. So this is the lateral view of your ankle and this is the superior view. Coming to the definitions of motions, three motions of ankle and foot complex that appropriate the cardinal planes and axis are dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion and aversion, abduction and adduction. So dorsiflexion and plantar flexions are occurring in the coronal axis. Inversion and aversion are occurring in the longitudinal axis and abduction and adduction are occurring in the vertical axis. So this is the vertical axis. This is the longitudinal axis. This is the coronal axis. And these are the definitions or fundamental movement definitions and applied movement definitions. So you can see here the movements, subduction, adduction, inversion, aversion, dorsal flexion, plantar flexion. So this is the normal movement definitions, but the applied movement, so the, the axis of the ankle joint will be in a oblique manner, not in the usual cardinal planes. So the oblique axis will be transiting in this oblique manner and the movements include your pronation and supination movements. So we can see here the pronation, the, what are the movements that is present in pronation includes your eversion, abduction, and dorsiflexion. You can learn by the mnemonics DAB, D, A, B, E. So D for dorsiflexion, A, B for abduction, E for eversion. The movements in the supination are inversion, adduction, and Plant affection. So you can learn by the mnemonics PADI, P for plant affection, AD for adduction, and I for inversion. So this is the description of the moments and deformities of the ankle and foot. So the first moment is your plant affection and dorsiflexion that will be happening in the medial lateral axis and in the sagittal plane. So these sagittal plane deformities you can see here in the pes planus. Pes equinus and pes calcaneus. And next one is the next moment is your inversion aversion, which will be happening the anterior posterior axis and in the frontal pain. And the deformities we can analyze in this view is your varus and valgus deformity. And next one is your abduction reduction that will be happening in the vertical axis. And so that will be happening in the horizontal plane. And what the deformities include your abductors and adductors. Next one is your combined movements, that is your supination and pronation that will be occurring in the oblique axis and varying elements of inversion, adduction and plantar flexion and varying elements of aversion, abduction and dorsiflexion for pronation. So in this, the deformities mainly are inconsistent terminally usually implies one or more of the components of supination. So mainly usually implies one or more components of pronation. So these are the movements and the axis and the planes and their deformities in the angle and foot complex. So dorsiflexion and plantar flexion occurring in the sagittal plane and coronal axis. Inversion and aversion occurring in the frontal plane and longitudinal or anterior posterior axis. Abduction and adduction occurring in the transverse plane and vertical axis. And pronation and supination in the foot are the motions that occurs around an axis that lies at an angle to each of the axis for cardinal, cardinal motions 
of dorsal flexion, plantar flexion, inversion or reversion, and abduction and erection. Non weight bearing, the pronation includes the components like dorsal flexion, eversion, and abduction. You can see DAB, D A B E, D for dorsal flexion, A B for abduction, E for eversion. And non weight bearing supination includes here plantar flexion, inversion, and adduction. So pa PADI, so P for plantar flexion, AD for adduction, and I for inversion. And this is the calcaneo valgus and calcaneo varus deformity. So the term valgus or calcaneo valgus refers to an increase in the medial angle between the calcaneus and your posterior leg. So this is the posterior leg and the angulation between the post calcaneus rib bone and your posterior leg is the increase. So 180 degree, so greater than 180 degree is known as calcaneo valgus and decreased, so decreased in the medial angulation between your calcaneus and posterior leg is known as your calcaneo varus or varus deformity. So next one is your angle joint. So the first joint in your angle complex is your angle joint. So this is otherwise known as talocrural joint. So this is the articulation between the distal tibia and fibula proximally and the body of the talus distally. The angle is a synovial type of hinge variety with a joint capsule and associated ligaments which is generally considered to have a single, single oblique axis with one degrees of freedom around which motions of dorsal flexion and plantar flexion occurs. So these are the articular surface. So you can see here tibia and the talus and the calcaneus. So the angle joint is formed by the tibia and fibula proximally and by the talus distally. So this is known as tibio talar joint otherwise known as the angle joint so proximal will be formed by the tibia and fibula distally it will be formed by the talus and other joints include your proximal and distal this is the distal tibio fibula joints and this is the proximal tibio fibula joints the proximal segment of the angle is composed of the concave surface of the distal tibia and of the tibial and fibula malleoli and the, these three phases form an almost continuous concave joint surface that extends more distally on the fibular or lateral side than on the tibial or medial side and more distally on the posterior margin of the tibia than on the anterior margin. The structure of the distal tibia and two malar resembles like a mortise and is referred to as mortise. You can see here the, the shape or the articular surface of the fibula and tibia with the corresponding Articular surface of your talus will be nearly forming like a carpenter's mortise joint. So this is the carpenter's mortise joint. So this will be similarly to your tibia and fibula, and this will be similar to your talus. So the similarity in the shape of the talocrural joint and a carpenter's mortise joint is demonstrated. So this particular blue color line is covered by your articular cartilage. And next one is your proximal tibiofibular joint. So this is a plain synovial joint formed by the articulation of head of fibula with a posterior lateral aspect of tibia. So this joint is formed by your head of the tibia fibula and the posterior lateral aspect of tibia. The faces of proximal tibiofibular joints are fairly flat, so flat in structure and can vary in configuration between the individuals. Generally a convex tibial facet and a concave fibular facet is the most common articulation pattern. So most commonly the tibial facet will be having convex in structure and the fibular facet will be having concave in structure. The proximal tibial fibular joint is surrounded by a joint capsule that is reinforced by your anterior and posterior tibial fibular ligaments. The ligaments of your tibial fibular proximal tibial fibular joints include your anterior and posterior tibial fibular ligaments. The motion at this joint is consistently small. However, symptoms of instability can occur following trauma to this area. Next joint is your distal tibiofibular joint. The distal tibiofibular joint is a synthesmosis or fibrous union. So that is between your concave facet of the tibia and the convex facet of the fibula. The, the distal tibia and the fibula do not actually come into contact with each other, but are separated by a fibroadipose tissues. Although there is no joint capsule, there are several associated ligaments. Because the proximal and distal joints are linked, 
the tibia fibula and tibio fibula joints are part of a closed chain all the ligaments that lie between the tibia and fibula contribute to stability at both the proximal and distal tibio fibula joints so both the proximal and distal tibio fibula joints so all the ligaments has been providing the that is attached or lying between the tibia and fibula contribute to stability of this particular joint that is the proximal and distal tibio fibula joints the ligaments of the distal tibio fibula joints are primarily responsible for maintaining a stable mortis so the ligaments which is present on the, our the distal tibio fibula joints are mainly responsible for maintaining a stable mortis of your ankle or teratocoral joints the anterior and posterior tibio fibula ligaments and your interosseous membrane provide supports to your distal tibio fibula joints so the main ligaments that provide support to the distal tibio fibula joints are your anterior and posterior tibio fibula ligaments plus your interosseous membrane the interosseous membrane directly supports both proximal and distal tibio fibula articulations although this joint is an extremely strong articulations injuries can occur the talus is forcibly laterally rotated with angle mortis within the angle mortis this injury can cause the fibula and tibia to separate and are diagnosed as high or syndesmostic angle sprains if the force were to continue fracture of the fibula proximal to the distal tibio fibula ligaments could result so mainly this particular distal tibio fibula joints are extremely strong in articulation and the injuries that occur that occur during the talus is mainly your lateral rotation of your ankle mortis so the lateral rotation of your talus within the ankle mortis so this may produce or this may produce significant effect over the ankle joints mainly that is your high or uh, high syndesmostic ankle sprains so mainly your ankle sprains if the force is high means it may even lead to fracture of your fibula bone proximal to your distal tibio fibula ligaments this is the distal articular surface of your talocrural joints so the body of the talus forms the distal articulation of the angle joint and the body of the talus has three articular surface as a large articular surface large lateral articular surface is for your fibular facet small medial for your tibial facet and a trochlear for your superior facet the large convex trochlear surface has a central groove that runs at a slight angle to the head and neck of the talus the body of the talus also appears wider anteriorly than posteriorly which gives it a wedge shape the articular cartilage covering the trochlea is continuous with the cartilage covering the more extensive lateral facet and the smaller medial facet the structural in integrity of the ankle joint is maintained through the range of motion of the joint by a number of supporting structures so this is the body of the talus which is trochlea surface that is the tibial facet trochlea surface that is the superior surface and next one is your medial or tibial facet this is the medial or tibial facet and the lateral or fibular facet to form the distal aspect of your ankle joint so all this the body of the talus is having three surfaces uh, for for the articulation of the three different bones this one is the capsules and ligaments the capsule is fairly thin and especially weak anteriorly and posteriorly so for the stability of the ankle depends on an intact so this is the important thing so the stability of the ankle depends on an intact ligamentous structures the ligaments that support the proximal and distal tibio fibula joints are your crural tibio fibula interosseous ligaments the anterior and posterior tibio fibula ligaments and the tibio fibula interosseous membrane so they are important for stability of the mortis and therefore for the stability of the angle so you can you can get a point that the capsule is very weak over the anterior and posterior region and the capsule is very thin as well as so the stability is mainly provided by your ligamentous structures the two other ma major ligaments ligament complexes maintain contact and concurrence of the mortis and talus and control the mediolateral joint stability the mediolateral joint stability as well as your entire stability of the ankle joint has been provided by this particular ligaments so mainly there are two major ligament complexes that is that includes your medial collateral ligament lateral collateral ligaments
we can see here this is the medial collateral ligament and this region is your lateral collateral ligaments the portions of these ligaments also provide support for your subtala joint also so the all these ligaments will be providing stability to your subtalar or talocalcanal joint also the function of the collateral ligaments in the ankle joint therefore is difficult to separate from the function of the subtala joints so these are the ligaments and their functions so deltoid ligament so that is crossing over the talocrural joint and what are the function is eversion dorsiflexion with associate posterior slide of talus within the mortise so in this moment the this particular tibio talar fibers of your deltoid ligament will be getting stretch and the tibio navicular fibers of your deltoid ligament will be crossing your talocrural joint and talonavicular joint and this will be stretch during your aversion abduction plantar flexion with associated anterior slide of the talus within the mortise and the talonavicular talonavicular joint the, this ligament will be stretched over your aversion and abduction next fiber is your tibio calcaneal fiber of your deltoid ligament this will be passing through a talocrural joint and subtalar joint and this will be stretched over during your aversion so the main the main motion which is stretching your deltoid or medial collateral ligament is your eversion motion next joint against ligaments is your anterior talofibular ligament so that is passing through your talocrural joint so this will be stretched during inversion adduction plantar flexion with associate anterior slide of the talus within the mortise and next joint ligament is your calcaneal fibular ligament so that is crossing through your talocrural joints subtalar joints and this will be stretched during inversion dorsiflexion with associate posterior slide of the talus within the mortise and subtalar joint through mainly through the stretch during the inversion posterior talofibular ligament will be crossing through the talocrural joint and the main uh, motions that will stress the posterior talofibular ligaments are your abduction inversion dorsiflexion with associated posterior slides of talus within the mortise the medial collateral ligament is most commonly called as deltoid ligament so as i already told you so this ligament will be fan in shape so fan shape that's why it is known as deltoid ligament it has two fibers superficial fibers and deep fibers that arises from the borders of the tibial malleolus and it is inserted in a continuous line on the navicular bone anteriorly and on the talus and calcaneus distally and posteriorly it is, so this will be starting from your distal or your tibial malleolus and it will be inserted anteriorly over the navicular bone and distally and posteriorly over your talus and calcaneus bone the deltoid ligament as a whole is extremely strong which partially accounts for a relatively low frequency of injury to this ligament aversion or pronation of the ankle and talus can injure the deltoid ligament so the deltoid ligament will be stretched mainly for your aversion or pronation of your ankle or talus however these forces may actually fracture and displace or avail the tibial malleolus before the deltoid ligament tears so since i already told you deltoid ligament is the most strongest ligament comparing with the lateral collateral ligament so this ligament the chance of getting tear or torn damage to this injury to this particular ligament is very less so even though it is happening means it may before have the ligament get got torn it may actually fracture the tibial malleolus next one is your lateral collateral ligament it is composed of three distinct bands that are commonly referred to as separate ligaments so the lateral collateral ligaments includes your anterior talofibular ligaments posterior talofibular ligaments and calcaneal fibular ligaments the anterior and posterior ligaments run in a fairly horizontal position whereas the longer or calcaneal fibular ligament is nearly vertical so these both or uh, both ligaments in which includes your anterior and posterior talofibular ligament that will be running in a horizontal manner and next one is your calcaneal fibular calcaneal fibular ligament that will be running in a vertical manner so this will be horizontal in nature two ligaments anterior talofibular and posterior talofibular ligament will be running in a horizontal manner and calcaneal fibular ligament will be running in a vertical manner 
In contrast to the medial collateral ligament, the LCL or lateral collateral ligament helps control the inversion and supination of the ankle and talus. In general, the components of lateral collateral ligaments are weaker and more susceptible to injury than those of the MCL. So while comparing the ligament strength of your medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament, the medial collateral ligament is more stronger comparing to your lateral collateral ligament. So the chance of getting injury in your angle joint is mainly because of your lateral collateral ligament. So the most ligament, the most important or the most commonest sprains or ligament sprains will be or ligament injury actually ligament injury is known as sprain so this mainly goes for your with because of your lateral collateral ligament so lateral collateral ligament sprain is the main or the most common form of ligament injuries in addition to the medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament portions of your extensor and peroneal retinacula of the ankle are also credited with with contributing to stability at the ankle joint so the stability of the ankle joint is mainly given by this medial collateral and lateral collateral ligament or in your entire ligamentous support plus some portions of your extensor and peroneal retinacula of your ankle are also providing some stability to this ankle joint or otherwise known as talocrural joint since i already told you the capsules of your talocrural joint or ankle are weaker and so it is very weaker anteriorly and posteriorly so because of this the ligaments is taking in charge of the of providing the stability to the ligament or to the joint so mainly your medial collateral and lateral collateral ligament plus your extensor and peroneal retinacula so also pro providing the stability to this angle joint which is otherwise known as talocrural joints so the inferior band of superior ret peroneal retinaculum which lies close and parallel to the calcaneofibular ligament appears to reinforce the ligaments. So this is the superior peroneal retinaculum. So which is close or parallel to your calcaneofibular ligament. So this will be providing the stability or reinforcement to the particular ligament structures or ligament support over your talocrural or angle joints. Talocrular joints. So the inferior band of superior retinaculum peroneal retinaculum which lies close and parallel to the calcaneofibular ligament appears to reinforce the ligaments so this is the superior peroneal retinaculum so which is close or parallel to your calcaneofibular ligament so this will be providing the stability or reinforcement to the particular ligament structures or ligament support over your talocrural or angle joints so coming to the axis in a neutral angle position, the joint axis passes approximately through the fibular malleolus and the body of the talus and through or just below the tibial malleolus. The fibular malleolus, this is the important point, the fibular malleolus and its associated fibular facet on the talus are located more distally and posteriorly. The fibular malleolus, comparing with your tibial malleolus, so this fibular malleolus are located more distally and posteriorly than the tibial malleolus and its associated tibial facet. The more posterior position of the fibular malleolus is due to the normal torsion or twist that exists in the distal tibia in relation to the tibia's proximal plateau. So you can see here this is the medial malleolus or the tibial malleolus. So this is the lateral malleolus or your fibular malleolus. So this is actually located posteriorly as well as inferiorly. So because of this, this is the normal axis. This was the normal axis which was supposed to happen. But the position of this particular bonds so make this into a 14 degrees inclination. So that is 14 degrees towards your transverse plane. So this is the posterior view and this is the superior view. Superior in superior view you can see the ankle axis is rotated 23 degrees so nearly 23 degree from the normal frontal plane so this is the frontal plane and this is deviated 23 degree from the normal frontal plane so you can see in the superior view it is 23 degree deviated and in the posterior view we can see it is 14 degree inclinated 14 degree inclinated towards your transverse plane in the posterior view and 
23 degree deviated in the frontal plane. The tibial, this tibial torsion or tibio fibular torsion accounts for the toward position of the 14 normal standing. So this is the actual reason why you, you can see there is some degree of toe out in your foot because of the that is happening because of your tibial torsion or tibio fibular torsion. The torsion in the tibia is similar to the torsion found in the shaft of the femur although normally reverse in direction. So the tibia so you can see the femur so you can see the torsion is torsion of the tibia is almost similar to your torsion found founded in the shaft of femur so although normally reverse in direction the amount of outward tibial torsion increases from birth until 10 years of age as the tibial torsion increases the axis of the axis joint is positioned more laterally in the transverse plane so because of the tibial torsion if the tibial torsion is increasing means the axis of the ankle joint will be positioned more laterally in the transverse plane all the variation axis clinical measures have been reported values that approximately 19 degrees of lateral torsion for both adult males and females so according to some researchers they had found that there is around 19 degrees of lateral flexion lateral torsion that is happening in both adult males and females coming to the ankle joint function the primary motions this is the kinematic and kinetic part of your ankle joint that is your talocrural joints the primary motions along with the ankle joints are your dorsiflexion and plantar flexion so the normal ankle joint range of motion is 20 degree for your dorsiflexion and 15 degree for your plantar flexion 10 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion is considered minimal amount needed to amble without any deviation so in order for a normal gait cycle you need minimum of 10 degrees of dorsiflexion so in order to work or in order to Mm, in order to move your foot so that is your normal gait cycle without any deviation you would just need or you you need at least 18 a 10 degrees of dorsi flexion so this is the articular three articular surface of the talus and the trochlea the small middle facet so small middle facet this is the superior trochlear surface this is the large lateral facet or fibular facet so this can be pictured as a part of cone shaped surface with ends of this cone cut off the larger end of the cone facing laterally so since it is larger facet they had demonstrated the lateral uh, the opening should be in a larger manner so coming to the kinetics of your dorsiflexion plantar flexion of your talocrural joint in this during dorsiflexion there will be posterior sliding of the talus and anterior rolling of the talus so in this dorsiflexion you can see the achilles tendon as well as your posterior capsule will be getting stretched along with your calcaneo fibular ligaments so all these three stretches will be getting stretched simultaneously so the water the stretches that is over your anterior aspect will be getting slack so that includes your anterior capsule anterior talofibular ligaments so coming to the conclusion or summary we can see here in dorsiflexion the anterior aspect what are the stretches that is present over your anterior aspect will be going for slack and what are the press what are the stretches that is present over your anterior posterior aspect will be going going for stretching so in this there will be posterior sliding dorsiflexion there will be posterior sliding of your talus along with your anterior rolling of your talus so sliding and rolling will be occurring in the opposite direction coming to the plantar flexion you can see here there will be anterior sliding as well as posterior rolling so the anterior sliding of talus along with the posterior rolling of your talus now what are those stretches that is present over your anterior aspect will be going for stretching and what are the stretches that is present over your posterior aspect will be going for slack so the posterior aspect what are the things or what are the stretches that is getting slack is your achilles tendon your posterior capsule your calcaneo fibular ligaments these are the stretches that, are, that is present over your posterior region will be going for slack and what are the stretches that is present over your anterior region that is your anterior capsule 
anterior tarafibular ligament as well as your so these all stretches will be going for stretching so coming to the conclusion in plantar flexion there will be anterior sliding of your talus bone along with the posterior rolling of your talus bone and the posterior capsule along with your Achilles tendon as well as your calcaneal fibular ligament will be going for slack and your anterior capsule anterior talofibular ligament will be going for stretching so this is the kinetics and kinematics of your dorsiflexion and plantar flexion so this is the factors that are increases the mechanical stability of the fully dorsiflex talocrural joints the increased passive tension in the several connective tissues and muscles is demonstrated the trochlear surface of the talus is wider anteriorly than the posteriorly so this is the trochlear surface of the talus so this is wider anteriorly than the posteriorly the part of dorsiflexion places the concave tibiofibular segment of the mortis in contact with the wider anterior dimension of the talus therefore causing a wedging effect within the talofibular joint since the trochlear surface or superior surface of the talus is wider over your posterior aspect so there will be some wedging effect that is occurring occurring in the talocrural joint so during the dorsiflexion ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion movements are limited primarily by your soft tissue restrictions active or passive tension in the triceps surae that is your gastrocnemius and soleus muscles is the primary limitation for dorsiflexion typically the less ankle dorsiflexion range of motion is seen with the knees extended compared to knee in a flex position so then uh, with the if the knee is extended means your dorsiflexion range of motion will be less comparing with the knee in a flex position this can be attributed to your gastrocnemius muscle lengthening across two joints when the knee is extended angle dorsiflexion is limited by your soleus and posterior talocrural joint capsules when the knee is flexed tension in the tibial is anterior extensor hallucinus longus extensor digitorum longus muscles is the primary limit to plantar flexions the medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament are under constant tension during dorsiflexion and plantar flexion and therefore help to guide your sagittal pain motions so during dorsiflexion and plantar flexions both your medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament will be under in a under in a tension so by this we are concluding your introduction to your ankle complex as well as your talocrural joints thank you